The hills in the northern French subalpine chains running up against Switzerland create some pretty spectacular landscapes. And the hillsides here provide excellent insights into the evolution of fold thrust complexes. So we're going to look at how deformation develops in mechanical multilayers. We're going to look at how strain localizes, and then we're going to use some ideas to develop a structural restoration and use this in turn to look at the evolution of fold thrust complexes in these types of settings. So where are we? Well, we're in the northern part of the subalpine chains. The deformation is in Miocene age, and these particular structures were not emergent, but they developed under a sheet of far-traveled slices, the pre-outs. The stratigraphy consists of a multi-layer of competent limestone units, which can range in thickness to in excess of 200 meters, and these are separated by layers of incompetent shales. So we have a mechanical multi-layer. We'll see that this is important for the development of the structures. So let's just get insight into some of the stratigraphy. One of the really key units is this Ergonian platform succession, seen here on a cliff section, sitting above the underlying uh, older Cretaceous strata. So these landscapes were studied by the Swiss geologist Léon Collet in 1943, and here's his remarkable set of serial sections capturing the structures as seen on the hillsides. On these cross sections, I've coloured them up. The black uh, is the Ergonian. The blue on here is the uppermost Jurassic Tithonian or Marm limestone through, through this ground. And then I've picked out a competent Brajotian age uh, limestone unit shown in the brown. But otherwise, these diagrams are essentially those of Collet. So let's use these to explore the structural styles developed in these different stratigraphic units. Starting off with the Ergonian, and here is the frontal anticline, and you can see that it makes a pretty spectacular plunging fold structure. You can see from Collet's section that the stratigraphic thickness around this fold is more or less conserved, so the Ergonian is deforming in a concentric style. Now let's skip down the section a bit into the Jurassic. So this is the Tithonian limestone seen on a hillside in here. And you can see this rather nice fold pair coming over. There's some minor faulting in the hinge, but it's that structure that we can see on Collet's section. If we go deeper into the stratigraphy, uh, in the bottom in here, we're looking at the Jurassic successions uh, that are deeper. The limestones in here are actually rather thinly bedded, interlaid with little shale units and we can see the fold structures that this stratigraphy develops picked out here and on the cross section. So significantly tighter, and in this case recumbent folds, developed in the lower Jurassic successions. So structural style varies depending on the stratigraphic unit. It varies through the stratigraphic multilayer. So now let's go to another set of Collet sections that lie just along strike. Here we go. And we can look at some of the structural styles seen here, which are exposed on a spectacular hillside. So first of all, there's this really famous fold structure in the Tithonian limestone, the Arpanaz fold, seen here on this hillside. It's many hundred meters high. So that's folding in the Tithonian. In contrast, on this section, the Ergonian is being thrust in a series of thrust slices. And we can see it looking down section here, um, there's the Arve Valley at the bottom, and those panels of rocks are three slices of Ergonian limestone stacked up one on top of the other by thrusts. So in this particular case, the Ergonian limestone is thrusting. So we can capture these structural styles on a cross section that is drawn systematically through this landscape. And here it is. You've got the Ergonian limestone, the youngest limestone unit shown in the orange. You've got the Tithonian limestone shown in the dark blue on the cross section. And then the Brajotian limestones shown by the brown layer. The incompetent shale rich units are represented by the white colours on the cross section. So we can use this cross section and try and restore it to look at the amount of displacement and how strain localises through the multi layer. And we're going to do this by essentially setting a pin through this frontal fold structure here, for reference. So measurements will be made relative to this uh, inclined pin line, and we'll do this layer by layer. So let's start off with the Ergonian. Here we go, and you can see that pin at the front. And on this cross section, the shaded areas represent areas where the bed thickness has been 
changed, thinned out as you go into the underlying limb on the basal thrust. But otherwise, when you go further out along the cross section, the bed thickness in the agonion is essentially retained, except in narrow shear zones associated with the thrust, and those are picked out as the stipple zones on the restored section. Okay, so let's drop deeper into the stratigraphy and add the tithonian through here. You can correlate between the two layers in the model through the ABC points in here, seeing in the restored section where they line up above each other, offset by interbed shear in the final state section. And finally, we can lay out uh, the Bajotian limestone at the bottom here. And here it goes, and the whole lot's detached from basement, which has been put in underneath. So we have a series of features in here that we can discuss. The restoration has been done assuming more or less retention of bed thickness, except where it obviously changes into the low angle inverted limb that underlies everything, represented on the restored section by that diagonally shaded material. But otherwise, bed thickness is presumed to be more or less retained, and these three units operate at key beds, and these can be readily restored by measuring their bed length. The intervening layers of shale-dominated rocks are assumed to have more or less uniform stratigraphic thicknesses across the section. So thickness variations that we see now represent strain and its variation. The relationship between these areas in the cross section and on the restored section, well, we're retaining cross-sectional area. So the cross section shows differential thrust localization with depth. We've used the competent limestones as key beds. We're assuming these more or less retain bed length. And for the shales, we're assuming that they retain cross sectional area from the deformed to the undeformed state. The restoration is somewhat arbitrary because we set up that arbitrary pin through the frontal fold structure that lies above the inverted limb that underlies the whole system. That was an arbitrary choice the restoration, therefore, could be slightly different, and there may be more complicated arrangements of interbed slip than we're showing here. Nevertheless, we can still use this restoration to explore how deformation localizes differentially with depth. So let's do that now. So here's a measured cartoon showing structural development where the deeper horizons, layers A and B, shown here in yellow and orange, are thrusting. Similarly, the younger layers, which are green and blue on here, are thrusting. But in between, we have a layer in the middle, layer D, that is folding. It's folding as a concentric fold. And to maintain compatibility between the thrust in the shallow and deep, the intervening shale units shown by uh, layers C and E must deform in a more distributed fashion. At this, we can take this a relationship and apply it to the Hojifa area. And for example, the Tithonian limestone fold, the Arpanus fold that we can see in the photograph, would be represented by the layer D on the cartoon below. So, if we restored this section, it would look like this. Thrust displacements in the deep and in the shallow, and a zone of distributed strain represented by that shaded area in the middle. So how do these systems develop? In order to create a concentric fold structure like this, where the bed thickness is retained above a basal detachment, requires fold hinge rolling. And the question is, within the fold pair that defines the fold, which hinge is rolling? So first of all, let's consider the antiform roll, which goes to here. So in other words, rather like a caterpillar track, the uh, fold is growing as the hanging wall, if you like, or the right-hand side of the layering, is pushed over the overturned limb. The sinform hinge line, shown by the green in here, remains fixed. It is the antiform hinge that rolls, or migrates. The counterpoint to this would be the sinform hinge rolling. And that's what we see in this lower diagram. So in this case, the antiform hinge remains fixed, shown by the green, and the sinform rolls. So more rocks that were on the left of the section become incorporated within the fold as it develops. So now let's consider the relationship of this fold to a thrust that might be developed in the younger strata that lie above this blue 
buckling horizon. In the antiform case, the thrust is stable, as we can see on here. It initiates just ahead of the green sinform hinge line, and we simply roll the antiform hinge up the thrust plane as the fold thrust complex develops. So this is a stable situation. The thrust can continue to grow and displace as the fold amplifies. But what about the alternative case of sinform rolling? Well, in this case, the trailing edge of the thrust will become deformed and refolded as the sinform migrates. And we can see how this develops going down in the profiles in here. So for sinform rolling, the forelimb of this fold pair would develop a really complicated array of refolded, broken through thrusts. That's not a requirement for the antiform rolling. So the complexity of the forelimb depends on which hinge rolls. What controls this is a question that at this stage we can't answer. So returning to the Hojif cross section, we've seen that thrust localization is variable through the stratigraphic pile. In many idealized theories of fold thrust localization, it's assumed that thrust localize from depth and propagate up. These outcrops from Hojif amongst others, demonstrate that that is an extreme end member and that the type of structure you get within your stratigraphic pile depends on its mechanical properties overall. Some layers may thrust, some layers may fold, and the challenge is to understand how those vary through the stratigraphy. So the Hoji for area is a spectacular area to gain understanding of fold thrust complexes. We've looked at how deformation localizes in multi-layers. Some layers can fold, some layers can thrust. The intervening incompetent horizons have presumably a more complicated strain history. We can restore these structures uh, using the key bed and formation area balancing method. And we've explored the structural evolution and we've seen how structural complexity can vary depending on how the fold structures amplify, specifically whether it's the sinform or antiform hinges that roll. This rolling hinge model and its implications requires more work to gain further understanding of fold thrust complexes.